Thank you for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. Hey, everybody. Welcome back, and thank you so much for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast. Mariano Alvarez here with Brent Labrada, and it's been a little while since we've had the opportunity to talk, just me and you, so I'm pretty excited. Before we dive into it, man, I do want to let everyone know that you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, all by searching Dog Trainers Podcast. And be sure to follow us on our personal social media pages as well. You can find us on Instagram. You can find Brent at Canis Behavior, and that's all one word, C-A-N-I-S-B-E-H-A-V-I-O-R. You can find me at Untamed Dog Co., all one word, U-N-T-A-M-E-D, D-O-G-C-O. Uh, we want to give a quick shout out to some people that have been showing us love lately with uh, a lot of our interviews lately. We've had, man, we've had so many, what's been Blake Rodriguez, Larry Crone, Natalie Dopkin and Matt Hubble. Sarah, Do- uh, Sarah Bruski. Sarah Bruski. Uh, we got Nahum Russell from uh, Com Canine Training. What's up? Yeah, well, thank you guys so oh, much for being on Oh, don't forget. With us. Mr. Jonas Black. <laughs> oh, Jonas. Sorry, bro. So, but, but I'm bringing this up because we can really tell, we can really tell not only that, that we're making such great friends with these people and really having the opportunity to expand our network and just, just converse and talk dog training. But we can also tell that because we have conversations with all these awesome people that we are getting some new listeners in some new places. So yeah. shout out to Manhattan, New York, Chicago, Illinois, Brisbane, Queensland, Columbus, Ohio. Thank you guys so, so much for listening. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to you, my friend. What's going on, everybody? As Mariano said, this is the first episode we have done in a long time that is just me and Mariano. And we are so, so grateful to all of our great guests. Just like he mentioned, uh, we got, you know, uh, the canine performance team, Natalie Dopkins, Matt Hubble, uh, Sarah Bruski, uh, Naham Russell, Jonas Black, you know, Larry Crone, Mr. Larry freaking Crone uh, honored us with his presence, which is great. Mr. Blake Rodriguez. Like we we have had such a blast uh, interviewing all of these wonderful, wonderful trainers. If you guys haven't listened to those episodes, episode, episodes, episodes. those episodes, <laughs> go check those out because they're they're a blast. Every single one of them. And they 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 teach us so many cool stuff. Um, but Hey, let's go ahead and talk about what today's episode is. Uh, yes. today's episode number 47, we're going to talk about our top five things that trainers get wrong, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is uh this is a, hopefully this is helpful for you guys. Now, again, these are not judgment calls. Uh, you know, we're not trying to put anyone down or make anyone feel uncomfortable, but these are things that we've learned through our careers, uh, that we did wrong, that we see our assistants doing wrong, that we see, uh, greener trainers do wrong. And we're hoping that this can help you guys uh, just kind of be aware, a little bit more self-awareness. So that way uh, it can help your business, help your clients, and most importantly, help your dogs. Absolutely. And understand this, you guys, we're going to dive in here very quickly. I just wanted to make the point that Brent and I, we continue to get such amazing support and and just feedback from our listeners. And if this makes sense, there's a certain trust in the listeners Mm-hmm. that like the podcaster has to have, you know, for example, I'll, I'll listen, I listen to all kinds of podcasts for all kinds of different things. And I do get annoyed when like the host just sounds like they think that the listener doesn't get it. Mm-hmm. You know, we know you guys are smart. We know you guys understand that we just want to make sure that we put out great content for you. So we know that you're going to take all this stuff, not as a negative, not as a put down, but just as in an opportunity to, to, to learn off of our experiences. And if it helps you awesome, you know, absorb it, take it in. It's like a lot of our guests have been talking about learn how to how to have that like efficient filter if it's something that applies to you take it and if not don't worry about it but with that being said let's dive right in so the first point that i wanted to get into is newer trainers they tend to spend way too much time defending a method or or tearing down other methods and and politics and dog training is i mean it's it's always something that's been just a super hot topic it's kind of weird that dog training is so political it like it really kind of outshines a lot of other a lot of other professions i feel Mm. Or maybe I just don't know. And maybe they're, they're like that too. But, you know, I, I just wanted to speak a little bit to how important it is to stop all the infighting, talk to people from, you know, other methods and other viewpoints in the training world, because not only is it important to have these conversations for, from the perspective of like, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, helping dogs, helping owners, keeping dogs out of rescues, keeping dogs from getting put down and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. But also as Sarah Bruski explained, I think very well, there is a ton of benefit to learning the different ways of going about things because there are skill sets that lie therein that I think will end up helping you overall. You know, so it, it's it's always important to be open to new ways of teaching, but I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about and, and just get your thoughts on yeah. 
on, on some of that stuff, like the various ways of, of training and, you know, and, and why they're valuable. Yeah. I think, you know, in dog training, it's, it's cool. Cause there's a bunch of different facets of, of training that people do, right? Like some people could be, uh, you know, R plus trainers, pure positive force free, which has its own art form to it, right? Like in order yeah. to not use aversives, you have to actually kind of be very, very creative as we learned with Sarah Bruschi. Uh, right. But on the other side, you might have someone who might be a complete compulsion trainer, right? Like I used to be a compulsion trainer when I first started out and I learned some very, very useful techniques. You know, I'm not going to knock it down hundred percent because right. uh, don't get me wrong. 80% of what I used to do is, is now evolved and a lot better, but there are some techniques that, that when you're working with high drive dogs or dogs who do want to control you and, and physically think they can take you, uh, there are going to be certain techniques and methods that, that I still use till this day when given those particular cases of dogs. Right. Uh, right. And those of you guys who work with aggression or, or worked in some type of keeler uh, method, you guys, you guys know those techniques that we're talking about, but um, you know, everything in between, right. When we're looking at e-collar trainers or we're looking at clicker based or marker based trainers, uh, when we're looking at, uh, you know, competitive sports or 4-H or we're looking at, you know, AKC, people who do just obedience and, uh, you know, all of that stuff, right? You're going to see that there's just a bunch of methods or approaches or angles that you can approach to training. And I remember when I was a younger dog trainer, you know, I, I just, I remember spending so much time convincing and trying to tell people like, hey, this is a prong collar. And I'm going to sell you on this prong collar because that was the only method that I knew. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, nowadays it's like, we're more versatile. Like I could use a martingale, I could use a slip lead. I could use a right. choke chain. I could use a, you know, a harnesses actually, even in some scenarios. Right. Um, you know, there, so there's, so there's definitely, I defended my method over and over and over, not because I, I, uh, I think part of it, maybe I was arrogant, right? So I thought my method was the best method because, you know, when you learn a method, pretty much it's kind of like you see the value it brings to you and you see the value it brings to the dogs that you train. So you're trying to convert everyone to that particular method, right? right, right. And, and when you start getting very, um, dogmatic about a method well naturally you have a tendency of wanting to tear down other methodologies and ideas and philosophies as not as valuable as yours right which is all right. e ego talking right this is all ego just in your head just trying to tell you how fucking good of a trainer you are right that's that's all it really is and so um you know i remember being humbled many many times where the technique that i was using wasn't being effective and I kept hitting a dead end with certain types of dogs. And I just remember, if, you know, uh, being humbled and feeling like, fuck, I don't know shit. And luckily, when I was growing up as a trainer, I had a mentor that I could be like, what do I do? And he was a balanced trainer before there was even something called balanced training. Right? right. So, so it was cool for him to be like, well, stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> right, well, right. If it's not working, stop doing it. You know, maybe try a different approach. I was like, what different approach? Try some food, right. try some this, bring out a toy, bring out this. And he also worked a lot in, in sport dog training. So mm -hmm. it was a lot. It was really nice to have someone that says, don't get frustrated. Think outside your box. He, he would always say, think outside your box. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know, cool. I think there's a reason for that. Like think outside your box. Do you remember um, you've done, you've done the like Tony Robbins event and, and I haven't mm -hmm. done like Tony Robbins, but I've done like similar, you know, yeah. and, and there's that whole thing, you know, like you draw nine dots and it's like, how mm -hmm. do you make three lines mm -hmm. cover all the dots? And the only way to do it is to make like a big triangle that goes past the, the boundary of the three line type thing. The point of the, of the idea is it can work, but you have to think outside the box and people have this tendency to just assume you can't go outside of the nine little dots in there. Right. And, you know, Bobby, who we've had on, shout out to Bobby. He's an amazing, amazing trainer. Yeah. Um, I think what, what, he, what he taught us, because I had a chance to work with him a little bit as well, not nearly as long mm -hmm. as you, is there is the reason that these various methods exist is because not only are there different types of dogs that respond to different types of training, but also because even if we're talking just one dog, like one example dog, the various ways that you can work one particular command hold different truths, hold different like bits of information that are going to be valuable to the dog and the owner and the trainers and stuff like that. And, and mm -hmm. here's a, just a quick example. So we have a few dogs in right now 
uh, who are who are very excitable, like to the point to where they're they're difficult to control. They're not like aggressive, but they're very nippy. They're puppies, mm -hmm. and they're really nippy in particular with mom. All of them. They're different moms, but all of them are you know. So they're a little calmer if I'm trying to like you know trim up their eyes because they're like you know doodles and you know or or just hold their paws to see if they need a trim for their nails something like that. They just will not sit still. With my trainer Julia, they're that much worse. Not because she doesn't know how to handle them, but they are just that much more excitable from the they jump. Like test her more. Exact yeah. one thousand percent. Now, my story is this: we've been working place commands. These are your younger puppies, mind you. And Julia is amazing with puppies, so she likes to do a lot of uh, a lot of fun, you know, toys, enrichment food. stuff, yeah. right? All that good stuff, which is definitely valuable. And the dogs are their patterning is looking amazing. These dogs will hop right on the bed; they'll lay right down, and, and it's great. And I and I totally get it. Yeah. However, here's a totally different way to teach the exact same command, the place command, mm -hmm. calm place patterning, the way that like Sean did it in his DVDs, the way that Jeff does it, the way that, you know, a lot of these guys where it's not a lot of toys, not a lot of food, you're slow down a leash uh, in their case, a knee collar, but not necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. very slow. I walk the dog on, I pick up on the leash to get him to sit down. I mark with the release. I move him off. Everything is very even keeled and slow, mm -hmm. but it's the same command place. The reason why these two different approaches exist is because one is meant to pep the dogs up and keep them moving mm -hmm. the to other, activate the dog. Right. 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 Like the Larry Crone uses place as an activator. Exactly. And the other one is meant on purpose to teach the dogs to slow down. And depending on what the issues are, like these puppies, learning how to slow down would be a very valuable skill. So, right. you know, I just wanted to kind of point that out that even if it's just one command we're talking about or one particular dog, sometimes it's beneficial to go through various types of the exact same command so that they learn all these different things. I want you to be excited and go to place, but when you get there, chill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a good point. I think that's, that brings context. Like something as simple as, you know, whether the dog does an active sit or an active down, you know, like in sports work, you want that dog to be focused and ready for the next right. command. And you want that, that dog to be storing up this drive so that that way, when you give the next command, the bomb, boom, he springs into action versus a lot of pet dog training. You know, if you, we want more calming, we want more anchoring, we want more grounding um, on, on certain concepts. And so there's going to be different ways to achieve those goals for exactly. sure. And sometimes they might even blend into each other, right? Like you might start with an active place command and then eventually you start teaching calm with duration and then even calmer for longer duration. And then maybe you start layering in some control with a little slip lead or an e-collar mm -hmm. or something. And gradually you taught a really awesome send away, but then all of a sudden you start teaching the dog. Now you're going to stay there for 30 minutes, you know? Right. <laughs> so right. little by little, you build it up for sure. Exactly. For sure. No, I think that, and I think that's good. And I, I think going back to this, to this topic, spending too much time defending your method and tearing down other methods. I think this is all ego, right? In, in newer dog trainers, again, no one says, you know, Hey, I want to be the most egoic, uh, you know, self-centered, uh, I know it all dog trainer. But what tends to happen is when you find something that is true or that works or that is helpful. And this is my particular opinion on it. You want to defend that truth, right? When you become dogmatic about something, you want you 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 you're gonna think that you have so much faith that what you're doing is right that you will fight for it, and in yeah. turn you will try and talk shit about other training methods. Yeah, I mean, and it, that's not that's not really which we true. which we see in the force free world all the time. You know, well, well, yeah, all of it, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, and that's not really something that's like surprising even to say. I mean, people don't want to be wrong. Nobody wants to be wrong, mm -hmm. right? That's just human. Mm -hmm. We get it, but. But, you know, the point we're making is while it's it's good to I mean, obviously, if you're going to be dogmatic about a method, mm -hmm. one would hope it's a method that you personally believe to be the best. So mm -hmm. while while it's a good thing to want to strive for what you think is the best, right, you still have to keep your eyes open because I've never come across. I've never come across like a single mainstream, not like crazy out there fringe method mm -hmm. um, that didn't have something very valuable in it. Like every single method I've learned over time is a take on, and I'm sure you would agree. I'm, I'm glad I did. It was totally worth the time and the effort and like, and unlearning certain things so that I could learn this and then you can learn it all back and task switch back and forth. It was yep. totally worth it. Yeah. True. Very true. Um, and I think, so I guess the whole, the, 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 the best way to kind of not correct, but just kind of wrap your head around this particular thing that a lot of trainers do wrong is just keep an open mind, you know, yep. like, like don't, don't be so, religious with your method, you know, or your idea, because every dog trainer, every method has 
something valuable to, to maybe add to your repertoire um, and, and what it is that you're doing. Yeah. So that's how I, that's what I would say. 